Welcome everybody to the counseling department's second night of post-secondary planning. I am Lori Cohen. I am one of the counselors at the high school and I am also the coordinator of the department. And I'm joined with by my colleague, Mrs. Ambrosia Martin, who's also here. Um, for those of you who are new to Zoom, it's been quite the year, but we are, we've kind of figured it out and it, it works nicely for us. So I'm gonna do a presentation. It'll be about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, this recording will be shared online, the slides will be shared online, and the actual recording of the presentation will also be online. So if you have to jump out during it or can't stay for the whole time, you can, or if you wanted to re-watch a part of it, you can always jump back on and that will be available on the high school webpage under the counseling department. There's a section for um, presentation. So that's where this will be found. If you have questions throughout the night, there is a Q&A section on the Zoom down, should be at the bottom of your screen. You can type in your question and Mrs. Martin can answer them on um, text or I can answer them in person. And then at the end, we will open it up for a little bit of questions, but hopefully we'll, you'll go away tonight with lots of information. So again, welcome to the high school's counseling department's post-secondary planning. So here's tonight's agenda. This is kind of what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the whole process. We like to call it a game just to kind of make it sound more fun and exciting. Um, it is an exciting period. Um, COVID has certainly thrown some, some detours in that way, but we are here to hopefully make this as easy and as calm for you guys as we possibly can. We're gonna talk about the college search process, the actual application process itself, junior year for the remainder of the year and summer and senior timelines. And then we'll talk a little bit about financial aid. So first of all, your kids should all, kids should all know who your counselors are. Hopefully you've all met with them in the last two months for course selection to pick your courses for senior year. That's really important to make sure that one, you've met all of your graduation requirements, but also that you are on track for the college experience that you're looking for. So hopefully you've had that conversation with your counselor. If not, it will be happening in the next week or so. We have till next Friday to complete all of those one-on-one -on -one meetings with your students. So make sure that they have asked about, that you ask about those and that they have had them. If for some reason it was overlooked, please definitely have them reach out to their counselors and here is the breakdown of last names. So the process. Lots of things to think about as you are considering what schools to pick. There are over 3,800 colleges and universities in the United States alone. So it's really hard to take that 3,800 schools and narrow it down to a manageable list of colleges for you to apply to. So how do you do that? You'll start thinking about what you like. Start thinking about what you're looking for in a college experience, what you need in a college experience, what you want, and just, just start brainstorming as a family. Uh, parents, it's always a nice time to capture this in a car ride if you're going somewhere because you have a captive audience they can't escape. So these are the questions and the conversations to start thinking about. First of all, you need to kind of think about the standards you're looking for. You know, what is, how is your overall GPA? Um, if you've taken SAT scores, how are they panning out? How is your course load? Are you taking a lot of AP and honors classes? How rigorous of a college are you looking for? Um, you want to look at the cost of college. Uh, you know, colleges, as we all probably know very well, are very expensive. Uh, you have to take into consideration tuition, room, and board, and fees that they offer. We do recommend that at this point, don't rule out any college because of money, because sometimes the sticker price on a college isn't what it and they end, ends up costing you. So a college could have a sticker price of a whole package of 70, 75,000 but you might end up getting merit money and enough financial aid that it doesn't cost you that much money. So don't rule it out. I always tell students and parents that just like you have to have some safety backup schools in terms of uh, the admissions criteria, you also wanna do that in terms of room and board. So if the package doesn't meet what you are thinking you can afford to pay, make sure you have a backup plan for, for cost as well. Size of school. Gosh, we have schools ranging from 40, 50,000 down to 800 kids. So you kind of have to know where your students would fit in best. 
Um, you know, there are pros and cons to every size school. Large schools certainly have the pros whereby they're, if your child goes in, doesn't know what he or she wants to major in, there's lots of opportunities, lots of room to change major, lots of room for research opportunities and activities and so forth. The negative of a larger school can be that sometimes you feel like a number unless you work really hard to make you not be like that. You might be in a class of 700 kids. So if you're in a the class of that size and you are not the type of student to engage, or if you're the type of student who may say, you know what, I think I wanna stay home this morning, it's too cold out, I don't feel like leaving to go to my class, my professor doesn't know anyway, you wanna keep that in mind. Smaller schools similarly have pros and cons. Um, the pros are you're gonna get that one-on-one -on -one attention. A professor is going to notice if you're not in class, they're going to build relationships, they're going to know who you are and they're going to know your name. Um, oftentimes class sizes run from 10 to 12 to 20 ki kids, very similar in size to a high school experience. So there is really that personal feeling that you don't always get at a larger school. Um, some of the negatives of a smaller school is if you do change your mind, you have to be more limited to your major choices. So, you know, there's something to think about and consider in terms of that. Um, average class size kind of goes into that. You also have to think about the location. You know, are you looking for to be in a city? And even in a city, there are campuses that are very campusy feeling. And then there are campuses that are very city feeling. Um, for instance, at Philadelphia alone, we have a large number of campuses. Temple itself has a beautiful campus. If you've been on their campus, it's green, it's grass, there's trees. If you go to Drexel's campus, it's a city campus. So the camps, the city is your campus per se. So there's not a whole lot of quad and community space. So kids have to think about that even within a city. Are they looking for a rural area, suburban area? So that's something to take into consideration as well. You wanna think about how far from home. You know, Kids are often like, I wanna go as far away as I possibly can. Once you start thinking about that though, you have to think about the additional cost and the hassle of being far from home. Um, if a, your student gets sick or if someone at home gets sick, it's harder to get back and forth. Uh, costs of, of airfare and transportation on um, holidays when ki college kids come home tend to rise. So those things have to be built into when you're calculating the cost. But you know there are certain excitement about going to a new location, a new city, so that's something that should be discussed. Are you looking at a particular activity or sport that you want to play? Um, some kind of um, special activity like, you know, are you an equestrian? So you need to be near a place where you could ride. Are you a swimmer? So you need to have access to, a, to an Olympic sized pool. You wanna think about all of those options. Um, facilities and housing, you'd be surprised at how many colleges still have the really old looking style dorms that we, some of us had growing up when we were in college, these cinder block walls, they still are out there. Um, but there are also campuses that have gorgeous freshman dorms and you're like, oh my gosh, this is nicer than my first apartment was. So that's a consideration to think about as well. You can find the average financial award on Naviance and on the college website. So that ties kind of into the money. Um, if you're looking for a specific major Make sure that, you know, if that's, and that's something that you've always wanted to do, make sure that the college has that available to you. And we talked about special needs, the equestrians, activities, and so forth. And then diversity, how important, you know, our kids are very fortunate that they have gone through the Cheltenham system that is a very diverse campus, a very diverse high school. Not all campuses are like that. So is that important to your students? Um, are they looking for an HBCU? to be around more people of color like themselves? Are they looking for an all girls school or a Catholic school? So you have to look at the diversity as, as a piece of this as well. Um, these are some things I think that, that we as parents tend to look at for considerations more so than kids, but these are really important things. Um, some of the statistics are critical to understand. What is the retention rate? Which means how many kids return to the campus at the end of their freshman year? Those statistics are available for you. Um, what's their four-year graduation rate? Most colleges are actually no longer showing a four-year rate. They show a five or a six-year rate. But what percentage of students do graduate within that time period? What's their job placement rate? Because your kid could go have an amazing college experience, 
But if they're not getting jobs at the end of that, those four or five, six years, then that becomes an issue. So look at that. What is their career center opportunities? What kind of co-ops do they have? What kind of graduate school acceptances do they have? Um, advisory system. What are advisors like for students in college? You know, do they have the same advisor every year? How is that assigned? Can you switch? Um, if parking, if you're especially in a city, parking, public transportation, how easy is it to get back and forth? And how much building is going on on the campus? It's amazing how many campuses are building and constructing and re redoing. So, you know, these are all things to consider. So where to start this search? I think we talked about this at our earlier meeting in the year. Um, Naviance is a great place to start. And again, I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly because we did cover it last time, but you can access it through the high school site under students Naviance. The student's username is would be 22 and then their first initial L and then their last name Cohen. Their password was set as their six digit ID number, but oftentimes they now have to reset it. Naviance has put a system in. So if that doesn't work, just click on forgot my password and it will email it to you. So again, we talked about last time, Supermatch is a really great place to go through all of these things that we talked about here. You will enter under Supermatch and it will help you generate a list of colleges that meet those criteria. Um, this is where you're working now as juniors. You're working in colleges I'm thinking about. This is where once you find a college, you're gonna click on a little red heart down here next to their student's name and you can um, add it to colleges I'm thinking about. College rep visits starting next year. Hopefully some of you attended some this year. We had all virtual visits. I don't know at this point what's going to happen for the fall, but we definitely have um, college representatives come from schools and universities and they meet with our students and these people who come represent the college they are the ones who are ultimately going to be looking and evaluating your students application they're the ones who are going to be making a decision so especially if you can't get to visit the college it's too far away they're not open in person and they come to a meeting here it's a nice way to get some face time so they can learn who you are often there are two or three four kids in a session so it's a lot of personal one-on-one -on -one time with a college rep. So strongly encourage students to do college visits if they haven't done so in their junior year as senior is in the fall. So this is what a college is I am thinking about screen looks like. So this student, um, I believe this is our, our favorite student, Joe Cheltenham, he has added four colleges He's added Albany State, Bloomsburg, Drexel, and Penn State. This will tell you what kind of application they use. If it says CA, it stands for common application. I'll explain that in the future. If it is just a blank screen, it will be, um, they, it will just be an electronic application. Okay. And this is another thing that I really like all of the colleges that you enter into colleges I'm thinking about will show up in this. And then you can click on a button that says, compare me. So what you can see here, these are the four schools that Joe Cheltenham put into colleges I'm thinking about. And he clicked on this button up here in the top right corner that says, compare me. What it does is it will show you Joe's GPA, his SAT scores, and then it will show you the information for the colleges. So Albany State's average GPA is a 3.14. That's why it has a little red X next to it because technically a 3.14 is higher than Joe's average. Now, if we compare a 3.1 to a 3.14, it's really negligible. So I wouldn't be concerned about that. But if you're looking at a Drexel with a 4.17 versus Joe's 3.1, then we start to realize that Drexel becomes a little harder to get accepted to for him than another school would. And it works the same way for the SAT scores. All right. Um, one thing to point out is that this is strictly based on numbers. And this is based on numbers from Cheltenham students only from 2013 to 2019. And so if you see over here on the right side, these acceptances at Albany State, we've only had from 2013 to 2019, two kids apply and one was accepted. So I'm going to guess statistically that this is not very accurate 
for Joe. It may be, but it's not, it may not be. But if I look at a Bloomsburg in the, since 2013, 270 kids have applied and 161 have been accepted. So therefore this becomes then a little more believable, if you will, than perhaps an Albany state when you don't know, because you don't know who the person was who didn't get accepted or did get accepted. So once you have a list of schools that you're interested in, what do you do with it? Well, in a non-COVID world, you're going to go visit them as much as you can. In a COVID world, you're going to visit those that are open and you're going to set up virtual tours and do virtual things. Colleges have done a really great job in a very short time setting up information sessions all via Zoom. They've set up virtual tours all through Zoom that you can take, watch videos and so forth. So I strongly encourage you to do that. However, more and more colleges are beginning to open up for tours for students. And that is truly the best way to see a college. Because if you think about it, colleges hire PR people to sell themselves. So it is a college, it is a PR person who is designing the virtual tours and taking the pictures and the pamphlets. And so that's going to explain why most colleges you see their pamphlets They've got kids in their college sweatshirts, sitting on grassy areas, beautiful sunshine with blankets and lots of kids. Um, go to the school and see what they're really like. That's the best way to get a feeling about a college. Um, if possible, again, we recommend eating in the food court or in the dining halls, if that's an option for you. Um, not so much to try the food, although certainly the food is important, but it also will allow you to watch the student body. Are they interacting? Do they seem happy? Because again, a tour, tour guides are trained to be peppy and cheerful and happy and sell their colleges. Um, some are better at that than others, which you will discover, but look at the student body. Do kids seem happy? That's really important. You want, you, you want to be there and because you want to be there. Um, all college tours, whether they are virtual or in person, you will register online. So you can just go to their websites and click on a visit and you can sign up for that. Some colleges, again, host open houses. Sometimes they have a whole day where you can spend and visit different departments and meet with financial aid and meet with student activities and see some clubs. Those are always a nice option as well. If a college requires an interview, definitely take the opportunity to do so. Um, some interviews are informational, others are used to assess you as an applicant. So it's a good idea to schedule interviews whenever possible. If it's an optional thing, it always can help you to interview. Students should go in prepared. They should dress nicely, whether it's on Zoom or it's in person. Um, you know, no chewing gum. Don't have your cell phones out. Uh, go in with some specific questions. And you don't want to ask questions like how many kids are at this school? Because that's something you can obviously find out easily from a website. But ask a question such as, oh, I'm interested in studying um, biotechnology. Can you tell me about some of the co-ops experiences that students have had? Oftentimes, your interviewer is an alumni. So ask them questions about their experience. What did you like best about this college? What did you not like about school? And, and really see what they like. Um, your counselors can help you practice with those. So if you wanted to do that, we would be glad to do that with you. Um, when you're finished, write a thank you note. It doesn't have to be by hand. You can send an email, but always acknowledge and just get the person's email address and make sure to send them a thank you. All right, so starting at the application process, most of this will be done next year, but there are some things that you guys can be doing now. And the more you do now, the better off you will be. Um, I always like to suggest that summer is a great time to get a lot of this stuff done because hopefully we will be back in the building next year. You're going to want to get involved in activities. You're going to see your friends, spend time with your friends, your family, and you're not going to want to do this. So the more you can get done prior to coming back to school, the better off we are going to be. Oops, sorry. No, oh, what am I doing here? All right. So what are colleges, oh, I'm sorry, looking for? So the first and most important thing a most every college says they're looking for are your grades and your GPA in college prep classes and the rigor of your course selection, all right? So they wanna see 
as good a grades as you can get in the hardest level of classes that you can take, that you can be successful in. So that does not mean you should take all honors and AP of everything if that's going to be a struggle for you. But if you're interested in becoming a science major, they are going to be looking for science level classes at the honors level, at, in high school or AP level. They might be looking for you to take more than one science class a year. Um, keep in mind students that your senior schedule is sent to colleges when you apply. So they are going to see, so you don't want to go into your senior year saying, I'm done taking hard classes. I'm going to cruise my senior year. We don't want you doing that. That will work against you for a college decision. Also keep in mind that the majority of colleges ask for mid-year grades to be sent. So you don't want to catch that senioritis disease that goes around too early. Um, it's kind of important to keep those grades up. Um, next thing the colleges are looking for are standardized test scores. However, Many schools are still remaining test optional for next year. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out because most schools were test optional this year and the majority of them are saying they're going to continue that. And it's kind of hard to know if they're continuing because of COVID, which is a certainly a legitimate reason, or they're realizing that they can fill student cl a class with students and evaluate them not putting as much emphasis on standardized test scores. However, if you are a good test taker and you have solid SAT scores, absolutely, you should submit them. If you're not sending SAT scores, the next, two, the next three items become much more critical. That's the essay, the personal statement, recommendations, and your extracurriculars. So let's talk a few minutes about these. The essay and personal statement. Um, every school will have its own version of it, unfortunately. Many of them, you can use the same one, but you will also have to write perhaps several different essays. You will begin working on them in your junior year English class this year. You'll be introduced to it and you'll get a rough draft on it. So when you get that assignment from your English teacher, please take it seriously. Please do not blow it off and write it at the last minute and, and treat it you know, as you might a regular assignment because this is something that's going to matter beyond your high school grade. So really take some time on that. Um, your teachers will go over some different pointers, but just some real basic common sense things. Um, stick to the word limit. If it says 250 words, please don't send 500 words. They do not care for that. Make sure you're proofreading. You're checking both for grammar and for spelling. Um, make sure that you don't, if, like I said, many kids use the same essay in different versions of it, but make sure you're not saying, well, I really want to go to University of Pennsylvania because I'm excited to walk the streets of New York. All right, so you want to make sure that you didn't overlap essays where it's going to be an issue. Uh, you want to write an essay that if the person who's reading it is, this is their 15th essay of the night that they've read, that this excites them, that this catches their attention. And it's actually a really hard essay to write because you don't know the author or, or the reader rather. So by the time you get to mid-year of your English class, you know what your English teacher is looking for. You know if they appreciate humor. You know if they appreciate um, you know, passive writing. You know what they're looking for. You don't know what these guys are looking for. And it's also hard to write an essay that is different and unusual and doesn't fit into the typical college essays that everybody knows about. And those topics tend to include things like the, the year my team won the state championship. Um, my grandfather is my hero because uh, my family and I did a volunteer um, experience in Costa Rica and it changed my life. These are all very common cliche topics. So your charge is to find a topic that's exciting and interesting that shows who you are as a person. And I've been telling this for years. One of the best essays I've ever read was a student who wrote about writing, making tuna fish sandwiches with her mother every Sunday afternoon. And you think, what a stupid topic. And yet it was brilliant and funny and sentimental. And it really gave an insight into the, the young woman who wrote it. So that's why you want to spend a little bit of time on this. And students, I know we encourage you to be independent and um, work on your own. But this essay is a good chance to have proofreaders. You want other people's eyes on it because you're going to become so immersed in it 
that it's going to be hard to step away from it. So have your parents proofread it. Have your English teachers proofread it. Um, don't let them change it too much because college reps are in this business, some of them for a long time, and they are very good at being able to tell an 18 year old voice versus an adult voice. So make sure it's still your story that you're telling and your words with some refinement by the adults in your life. All right. Um, teacher and counselor recommendations. So this is going to become important also, especially if standardized test scores are not utilized. So most colleges are looking for two or three teacher recommendations. You want to spend some time now thinking about who you would ask to write your recommendations. So you're looking for teachers that you've had, don't have to be teachers that you are a straight A with. Um, sometimes those teachers, those classes were easy and you didn't participate perhaps, or you didn't have to put in a lot of effort. But if you had a class that you worked your butt off and you met with your teacher at office hours and you went for extra help and you, you know, pulled your grades up, those are the teachers that are going to write you a really good, solid recommendation. You want to try to stick with junior teachers as much as you can. Uh, we know that this year it's been harder perhaps to make connections with your teachers. So if you don't feel that, it's okay to go back to your sophomore year. Um, we encourage you if you are applying to a specific major to get a teacher in that subject area. It's not necessary, but it certainly looks good, especially if you're applying to that major. So if you're going in as a science major pre-med, see if there's a science teacher you've had who could write you a letter. Um, we don't want you to send more than two or three because again, college people have to read this and they don't want to be having too many to do, to read or that will basically all say the same thing to support your, your application. Um, so we're looking pretty much, we recommend two, diff, two teachers of two different subject areas and then perhaps as someone from an extracurricular activity or a job or something like that. Then there's a counselor letter. Some colleges are asking for college recommendations. And if they are, we have a form in Naviance that we do need you to fill out. Um, counselor recommendation is different from a teacher because we talk about you as an overall student. So whereas your teachers are gonna talk about what you're like as a student, we as counselors are going to talk about more your personality, your character, your extracurricular involvement, um, so keep that in mind too. And remember, we won't write the counselor recommendation if the Naviance form is not filled out. Finally, colleges are looking for extracurricular involvement and they're looking for leadership. So they're not looking for you to be involved in 15, 16, 17 different activities. Colleges are very content with you picking two or three activities that you've grown with and, and done all your high school year and, and have grown into a leadership role if possible. Um, they're looking at for volunteer experience. Um, believe it or not, jobs are looked very highly upon by colleges because it shows that you're responsible, you know, that you are reliable, that you can be counted on, you have good work habits and ethics, especially a job that you've had for a while. So if you don't have a whole lot of activities, take some time and really think about what you could do over the summer. Are there any volunteer experiences? Um, could you get a part-time job? You know, should you involve yourself in a club or an activity? Read the homeroom announcements. Lots of clubs and activities are still happening even though we are virtual. All right, so what types of applications are there? At this point, applications are all online. I don't think I've seen a paper application in 10 years at this point. Um, there are school specific applications. That means you're gonna go to a college's website and you're gonna click on apply and they're going to have their application right there for you to use. Then there's something called common application. This is our most popular version. There are over 700 schools that use common app. You fill out the basic demographic information once um, and then you will personalize it what each college wants. You still have to apply and submit to each school individually, but you only have to fill out the basics one time. So it's actually a, a pretty good time saver. Coalition application is something that has started in the last few years that's similar to the Common App, but as you can see, Common App has well over 700 schools, whereas coalitions is right around 100 at this point. So there's just like there are application types, um, applications, there are types of admissions also. So here's what we have, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about these. First of all, there's regular decision. 
that means the colleges has, has set a deadline. Typically, they are usually right around the beginning of January. So all applications have to be in by January 1st. Um, and nobody's application will be looked at before January 1st. Everybody's will be evaluated after January 1st. And then everybody gets a decision on the same day, usually at some point in the end of March or beginning of April. Um, it doesn't matter if you fill out that application September 1st or December 31st, still treated equally. Then we have rolling admissions. Rolling admissions means that as your application comes in, they will give you your admission decision within four to six weeks. Um, there are some benefits to doing a roll in, rolling admissions application early in the fall. And by early, I mean September, October. Um, what one of the benefits is at that point, there are fewer kids who are applying. And so the, the pool is wide open. So you have a better chance of being accepted in September, perhaps, than you would in April when they're down to only a few slots. Um, also, the nice thing about rolling admissions is you can have a decision early. Um, University of Pittsburgh is really well known for this. If you apply to University of Pittsburgh in August, kids have decisions sometimes by the first or second week in September. Even if it's not your first school, there's something really good about getting that first acceptance into a college. So if there's a rolling admissions to application, absolutely use that option and apply by the end of October, Halloween at the absolute latest. Then there's something called early action. This tends to be some of your more selective schools. Um, they will set an early date for, for application. Usually it's like mid-October. And as long as you apply by that date, you will have an answer by, again, usually it's like mid-December. Um, so one of the benefits of that, again, is similar to rolling admissions, is that you get your answer super early to that college and it's one less thing to worry about. So if a college offers early action, I 150% encourage you to apply with that option. Um, there are some schools, University of Maryland being one of them, if you apply early action, you are considered for merit money, which is free scholarship money. If you don't apply early action, you're not considered for that kind of aid. So again, you can see there's a real benefit to early action. All three of these decisions, you do not have to give the college a decision until May 1st. Right. So even if you hear from a college in September, you, you have until May 1st to make your decision if you're going to attend that school. Then we get to what's called early decision. Early decision is a binding agreement with you, your parents, your counselor, and the college. And what you sign, because we all have to sign it, that if you are accepted to the school early decision, you will withdraw all other applications and you will deposit and attend that college. So the question is, why would I do that? Um, some kids want, just know exactly where they wanna go. They want to be at that school. They visited it. They feel comfortable. They know that's their place that they want to be at. Great reason. Um, other students apply early decision because they believe that it is a little bit easier to get into early decision than not early decision. And colleges are going to tell you that's false. They're going to tell you that it's not easier to get into early decision. However, having been in this field for 24 years, I'm going to disagree with the colleges. Uh, my experience, early decision does give the kids a slight edge to the application. So kids will use this on a very selective college that they are interested in because, and if you think about it, it's a simple numbers game. In an early decision, you might have a thousand applicants and they will take 400 kids from that versus regular decision. If you don't do early decision, they might have 5,000 applicants and, and I'm just using real round, easy numbers that they might only be able to take a thousand kids from. So you can see it, it, the numbers percentage wise, more kids are accepted early decision than regular. Um, some colleges will accept up to 40 to 50% of their freshman class through early decision applications. The reason that is a win for a college is it's a guaranteed admit and acceptance for a student. So colleges get their rankings based on something that's called the yield. And the yield means it's, it's the number of students who are accepted 
versus the number of students who actually attend the college. An early decision, the acceptance and the attending are one and the same. So it's at the college's benefit for students to apply early decision. So having said that, can you break the early decision contract? Well, they're not going to come and arrest you or fine you or anything like that if you get out of it. They will tell you that they want you to look at the financial implications of applying early decision. And if you're not sure if you can afford the college, um, they actually have something called the net price calculator that can calculate what the what your a rough, a pretty good solid estimate of what your financial aid will look like. They want you to use that before you commit to early decision. Um, but yes, if you change your mind and you say, I've changed, I'm not going to go early decision, there's nothing legally they can do to you. However, you can guarantee that you will not be allowed to attend that school through regular decision. And some of the um, more selective schools, the Ivies do share their early decisions lists. So that could work against you. So one of the reasons that counselors have to sign it is so we can have these conversations with your students individually. So if you're considering an early decision application, please talk about it with your students counselor so we can make sure that you're not putting yourself at a disadvantage. Um, so that's early decision. Some schools have moved to early decision too. It's the same concept. It's just instead of the October 15th deadline, they've moved it to January 15th. So if a student doesn't get into their first choice, they can apply to a second choice through early decision. Again, it benefits the colleges because it helps them with their yield. And then finally, we have open enrollment. Um, that's our community colleges that as long as you graduate from high school, you are accepted and you can apply to them as late as May, June, and you'll still be able to attend. All right, so what can you do now? First, you can be working, starting to brainstorm your essay. If you go to a college application, a college's website now, you can see their applications from, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, you can see their application from previous years, you can get an idea of what their essay is going to be. Um, they typically don't change year to year. So you can start brainstorming and thinking of ideas. Again, our hope is that you leave this school year with a pretty solid rough draft of an essay that you can use through your English classes. Um, you can start working on a resume. Some kids will type up a formal resume with all of their activities and extracurriculars and jobs that they've done in high school. Others don't, but you can still make a list of them just so when you're ready to fill out your application, you know everything you've done. They're looking for information, activities that you have participated in from ninth grade through 12th grade. So you can include activities you anticipate working on in your senior year. Um, that includes volunteer experience, that includes job experience, that includes school activities, out of school activities, sports. So take some time because it's amazing how much you might forget. Brainstorm nine through 12th, all of the things that you've been involved in. Start thinking about your letters of recommendation. Who are you going to ask? Who do you feel could write you a solid recommendation from your junior year, if not your junior year, your sophomore year? And it's always also a good idea right now to reach out to those teachers and just give them a heads up. Hey, Mr. Manser, I'm thinking of asking you to write my recommendation for college. And he'll probably say, oh, that's awesome. See me in September. But this way it kind of puts you in his mind. And then if you've decided you're gonna go through with testing, um, I know we offered the March testing. We are not a test site at Cheltenham for the remainder of the year, but there are some other places you could test. So think about that. And here are the remaining test dates. Again, none of these are at the high school. Um, well, actually the June one is not at the high school. You have to register for that by May 6th. Some of the local schools are offering them. So you certainly could find time. And then the tentative dates for the SATs are October, August 8th, October 2nd, November 6th, December 4th. All of those dates are acceptable for seniors. The October one will definitely work for um, early decision and early action. Um, and you'll have to check with the college's decisions whether the November 6th one will. Uh, college board site says that those registration deadlines will be available in early July. And we have not yet determined what we will be hosting at Cheltenham High School for next year. So stay tuned for that one. Um, if you're interested in taking the ACT, here are the dates listed for them. Again, we are not a test, score, a test site, 
but local, some of the local schools are. So you can certainly look at that. And if you can see, there is a July date for ACT. So if you wanted to give that a test to try, you're certainly able to do so. Um, you wanna now start thinking about sending your scores for free. So once you register for a test, you get included with that registration is four free score sends. Um, if you don't send them now and then you wait till the fall and decide to send them, it costs you about $12 a test to send. So if you know of if you know of some schools that you are absolutely going to be applying to, send your scores to them now. It'll save you twelve dollars. It's twelve dollars is twelve dollars at this point. Okay. All right. So what can you be doing now? So here's what you can be doing between now and the spring and the summer. Again, we talked about visiting the schools. Um, if you can get there in person, I strongly recommend it. I think that's really critical. If not, definitely sign up for the virtual tours. Many colleges track whether students have um, visited them. And so don't just walk around and visit yourselves, but rather make sure you're registering your visit with the Office of Admissions because they do keep record of that and see who's interested in their schools. Um, start thinking about financial aid moms and dads and guardians, that's kind of important. And I'll talk about that in a little while. Nothing you really need to do a whole lot right now other than start thinking about it and talking to friends about loans and aid and so forth. Um, register for and take any more of your SATs or ACTs that you need to and send the school reports. Again, start reviewing online applications. Common App is actually you can start filling out the preliminary information now. All of the demographics can be filled in now. And then the individual college ones tend to open mid-summer, usually August 1st, a lot of them open up work on those essays. Um, in Naviance, under About Me is the request for the counselor recommendation. There are seven questions. We don't care about grammar, punctuation. You can write it in bullet points. We just need the information there. So that's something you could take a little bit of time and work on right now, just so that it's complete. And finally, your social media. So um, there are colleges that will absolutely look at your social media. Now, I can guarantee you a Penn State is not looking at it. They don't have, with the number of students who apply, the ability to do that, too big of a school. But some of your private schools, your smaller schools are absolutely going to be utilizing software to check social media. And so students, even if you think that you're private and you're locked down, you're not. These are public sites. It's the public internet. When you signed up back many years ago, you gave permission for that. And so they can hire programs to search for social media. And so if you have pictures of yourselves um, with the red solo cups or with the, you know, haze of smoke around you or doing things inappropriate, it's time to get those pictures off immediately. Um, don't think that just because your Finsta name or your fake Snapchat name is not your same name that they can't find you. There's facial recognition. So all of that should be cleaned up. Now, conversely, if they see you on social media participating in Blue and Gold Day or you know, working at a 5K run or at a park with friends having a you know, Frisbee game with your masks on, that's going to look good for you because you know, they do understand your kids. So just take a peek at your social media, make sure it's appropriate. If it's not, it's time to start cleaning that up, okay? Um, also, at the same time, and I didn't write this on here, but this is kind of important, make sure your email address is an appropriate one. Um, I don't recommend using your Cheltenham email address when you apply to colleges, because once you graduate, that email address is no longer accessible. So create a free Gmail or Yahoo or Hotmail email, but make it be a professional sounding name. So Lori Cohen 1012 at Gmail or, you know, something simple that can identify who you are, but it's professional and use that just for your college stuff because you're gonna get so much college mail that you don't wanna miss anything. So you need to have an email address that's kind of reserved just for college stuff. So senior year, what can you do? Um, we always hold a college application night at six o'clock on back to school night. Um, back to school night typically starts at seven, we go at six. This is critical because that's how we're going to teach you how to complete and submit all of your applications, request your transcripts, request your letters of recommendation. We cover all of that in September. So if you 
can only do one thing next year, that's the thing you should do, moms and dads. Um, senior year, you're doing your applications as early as you possibly can. We want those done by fall, October, Halloween at the absolute latest. Lots of testing opportunities in the fall if you want to. Talk to your teachers about recommendations. Attend the rep visits. Attend financial aid nights. We'll be setting those up for the fall. Start looking for scholarships. We update them in weekly in Naviance for seniors. So you'll have lots of opportunities to look at those. If you are going to be playing division one or division two sports in college, you also have to complete the NCAA clearinghouse and you need to submit a transcript and a test directly to them. So your counselor can help that. Um, families, the FAFSA is the financial aid form. You can submit that as early as October 1st. You don't even need to have finished your college applications to do the, the financial aid form. You're going to be using your 2020 tax information. And seniors, keep your grades up. As I mentioned, it's a lot of times that senioritis takes over. It, it hits hard and sometimes it hits real early. But it, remember, colleges are going to be asking for grades through at least end of January. And then your final transcript will be sent to the colleges you're attending. All right, now there's financial aid. And I'm just gonna gloss over this fairly quickly because right now there's not a whole lot you can be doing. Um, so this is just a real basic, basic look at it. We do do a financial aid presentation in the early fall with a local financial aid representative from a college who will go over this in much more in depth. So there are two kinds of money. There's merit money and there's need-based money. Merit money is money that a college will give you based on some criteria, whether it's good grades, whether it's where you live, whether it's an activity. Um, merit money is money that is grant money that does not need to be paid back. Need money is based on your financial aid situation. So this is money that the federal government will determine how much you can afford and how much of loans or grants that they will agree to give you based on your family situation from 2020. Um, they will use the FAFSA, which stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Um, notice I said free application. You should not pay anyone to do this. If you do, you're on a scam site. Um, you will fill out the FAFSA based on your 2020 tax information. Both parents and students have to fill out the FAFSA. Um, if you are divorced, you would only fill out the FAFSA based on the parent that the student lives with the majority of the time. If you are remarried, your spouse's information will count. Um, it's a basic look numbers looking at income, assets, and savings to checking accounts. And from there, the government will determine how much aid you are eligible for. Then they pass that information to the colleges and the colleges then put together a package that will be made up of loans, scholarships, work study money. And then you will have a chance to review that and accept what you're interested in taking. Um, most students do not get enough financial aid from the college that if they need to take out loans, they're going to have to look at some parent plus loans or some private loans. And that's something that our financial aid presentation will go over in more detail in the fall. Can't apply for those until the spring of your senior year. Some of the private schools are using what's called the CSS profile. It's another form. It's actually sponsored by College Board. And ironically, you have to pay to fill it out. So only use it if a college requires it. And this is going to ask for more information than the FAFSA does. So this will include the um, divorce spouse parents information. It will include vacation homes. It will include tuition for other students, for other high schools that you're paying for. This includes a lot more information. Every college is required to have what's called a net price calculator. You can Google net price calculator, Penn State University, net price car calculator, Johns Hopkins University, net price calculator, University of Southern California. And it will take you to that link. You will enter your information from 2020. They, some of them ask for things like your student's GPA, their SAT scores, and it will give you a rough idea of what your financial aid package from that college will look like. 
it's a nice tool to use because you kind of go into it eyes wide open, knowing whether there's a chance that you'll be able to afford that school or not. Um, and then finally, there are scholarships. These are above and beyond what a college offers you. These are private scholarships. Um, employers might offer them. Um, you might get a scholarship from like a local Rotary Club, or you might get a scholarship for being left-handed or being a twin. Um, never pay for a scholarship search opportunity. They are out on the webs, easy to find and access. Um, back to the FAFSA, you will be able to access it again, as I said, October 1st and file early, watch deadlines. The earlier you apply, the better chance you have of getting some good financial aid. So watch your deadlines on that. Here are some good scholarship websites. Again, feel free to take a picture of this or it will be posted online. Um, you can use these to check. A lot of these scholarship opportunities will list, um, you'll fill out some criteria, you'll fill out a questionnaire and then they will start to match you and email you as scholarships come up. Um, stay in touch with us, please. Um, email your counselor. Students, feel free to set up um, Google Meets with us for this year. They're where we can help you with this process. You could say, hey, I went to Mrs. Cohen's meeting. I have a few questions for you. Um, I'm going to be starting to send out counseling e-blasts through Mrs. Jordan. This is how you found out about this, act, this evening activity. Um, also, a Naviance emails. Parents, you should be getting information for emails from us from Naviance. I sent one today to you. Hopefully you, you got that today. If you didn't, you can log on and add your information or you can contact your student's counselor. Make sure we have the correct email address in Naviance so you can get our emails that we send as well. Um, sometimes it's really hard as families to navigate this process um, for any number of reasons. And there have been many, many students and families who set up meetings with counselors one-on-one -on -one, and we do a really nice conversation and talk about individualizing it for your students. So if that's something you are interested in, I strongly recommend you as a family, reach out to the counselor and set up a meeting. I also cannot tell you how many times a parent will call me and say, Oh my gosh, my kid isn't doing anything in this college process. Can you please make a meeting? Don't tell them I called. And I will call the kid down and, and, and go forward. I can also tell you how many times I've had students say, oh my gosh, my mother is driving me crazy in this process. Can you please calm her down? And I will work on that as well. So really use us to help you navigate this so that it's as painless as it can possibly be. All right, any direct questions, email your counselors. But, oh, look at my time, perfect, 7.25. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. You can raise your hand if you want. I don't know how to see if people's hands are raised. Okay, I see somebody's hand is up. College meeting, do you have a question? Any questions? Come on, we have to have some questions here, people. Here we go. All right. Is instant decision happening this year? So that's a great question. For those of you who don't know what instant decision is, in the past few years, we've had several colleges come to the school or this year do it via Zoom where they, kids will sign up who are interested. You have to apply ahead of time. And then you will um, meet with the rep with their transcript, we'll provide you transcript and they will give you a decision, yes or no, right there on the spot. So absolutely, we plan on continuing instant decision for next year. The cost for the SAT is about $55, I believe. And this essay, ACT is about the same. At this point, most colleges are not requiring the essay. So I would recommend that you not take the SAT with the essay. Um, FAFSA can be completed starting October 1st, anytime after that. 
How can my daughter apply to waivers for college applications? Great question. If your student took the SAT with a fee waiver, there should be four free college application fee waivers in their college board account. If they did not take the SAT, they should reach out to their counselor and we can help them get waivers for both the SATs and for college applications. Easiest way to find out if a college is requiring the SAT is to go to their website and go to admissions information and it will tell you what they're requiring and whether it's test optional or not. Does the high school offer any scholarships? We do. Um, they are awarded to seniors and you do not have to apply for those. There is a scholarship committee that determines whether students um, are awarded them. There's also the Cheltenham Foundation that will send you information to students for scholarships and they have several thousand dollars that they give out every year to our students. So in, in the March-ish of next year, look for an email from the Cheltenham Foundation for scholarships. What is the regular deadline for early action? That depends on each college, has sets their own deadline. They are typically anywhere from October 1st to October 30th. What is the value of taking the ACT? What is, when is that adv advantageous? So the ACT and the SAT are used in the same way for college admissions. They are slightly different tests. The ACT is more science-based, if that makes sense. There's a little more data analysis, um, graph reading and so forth. Um, it is a longer test, but some kids find it's easier, some find it's harder. So I always recommend if you want, take both tests one time, see what you think about them. You can go online and find comparison scores and see which one your student did better on. And then he or she could focus on that particular test. But you do not have to take both tests. No, you can um, take one or the other. Oh, thank you. Other questions? If you wanted to major in the medical field, would it be beneficial to take the ACT? The only reason it would be a benefit is you may do better in that, um, but there's no benefit to taking it in terms of guaranteeing you admissions into like a pre-med program. So the benefit might be you might do better on it, but no benefit otherwise. Um, where can you find SAT prep courses? Great question. Um, my favorite SAT prep course is called Khan Academy. It is online, it is free. Um, did you hear that? It is free, not much is free from College Board. Um, however, what it does is it links your students' SATs or PSATs into your Khan Academy account and it will design a practice specifically for your students' needs and um, weaknesses. Um, studies have shown that students who put 10 to 20 hours of study time into Khan Academy boost their scores up by 100 points. And I saw that with my own son, so I am a huge believer in Khan Academy. However, it is self-driven and self-motivated. So if your student is not the type who's going to do that on his or her own, there are other SAT prep classes. You can look at um, Princeton Review, Kaplan, um, Huntington Learning, they all offer them. They tend to be fairly costly. There are private tutors. Um, that you could hire also to work with your students, but again, they tend to be costly. So my recommendation is firstly to start with Khan. Um, do the keystones count for anything? Not towards the college application process, they do not. Uh, is there a way to manually enter SAT scores into Naviance? Yes, so we actually have, are transitioning to a new um, counseling secretary. So she is learning how to do that. They March SATs should be into Naviance. We thought by the end of last week, but we got held up with some training there. So hopefully in the next few days, but if for some reason they are not there and you want to manually have them entered, reach out to your counselor, let them know they are not there and we can make sure they get there. And yes, this video will be posted on the, um, help, the website, the high school's website under counseling. There's a section for presentations. 
I will have posted both the slideshow itself and the video presentation. All right, other questions. Good questions tonight, guys. Thank you. Well, if you don't have any questions, it's about an hour's time. That's what we shoot for. I find that any more time, it becomes overload and you just don't remember anything I'm saying. So have a great night. Thank you for joining us. And again, stay in touch with us, your counselors. Reach out to us, schedule appointments, whether it's with just your student or with your student and the parents. Definitely recommend that you do that. Thank you everybody for coming.